It is true of France, it is true of Germany, and it is true of the French-German access. None can aspire to leadership of a community of 27 members, including the countries of the former Warsaw Pact, because none can provide the security guarantees that once again, read the papers please, are the essence of so many of these countries' national existence. Huh? We're not in a Cold War, but we're in a moment of enormous and deep change in relation uh, to a new and troubling Russia. If Nicolas Sarkozy wanted to attempt to change that reality, France would have to basically transform the notion among many of its partners that it is nothing like an unselfish team player. He would have to prove that France has junked its ambitions to make Europe the amplifier and vector of its own international goals. For all his promise as a man of change, and I accept his desire, the fact is that Sarkozy bases his view of Europe on an interest to exert political control of the European Central Bank and its management of the Euro. His is a vision of Euro as a protector of national economic interests rather than guarantor of the Lisbon Agenda's ambitions and standards for open market reform. That's not to mention, and I like the man, uh, that's not to mention his lack of interest in any reorganization of the EU's common agricultural policy that would nullify its exceptional advantages to France or to turn France's military nuclear capability into a European deterrent in the hands, if that's conceivable, of all its members. Germany, Germany. It has never felt able to provide security guarantees. Grand coalition or not, it is unable to offer a clear enough statement of its attitudes towards the emergence of an aggressive Russia to win the confidence of the EU as a whole. And I'm not talking about Poland or Estonia. I'm talking about basically the view of people toward their new situation. However much Angela Merkel's confident relations with America have helped strengthen her world role, the wary, nervous responses of her EU presidency to Russian behavior, huh? uh, think uh, beyond Germany's special energy deals with Moscow or its non-insistence on an energy charter committing Russia to fair rules governing gas and oil supply, these things have not made Berlin a locus of consensual leadership and confidence. As for a reasserted French-German axis, both countries' refusal to play by the Maastricht Treaty rules in getting their economies in order during the Chirac-Schroeder era, while other countries, I'm thinking of this one, were accepting the pain of compliance uh, with its goals, was a factor in the rejection, particularly in the Netherlands, of the Constitution. Germany itself, no longer a source of cash sacrificed for a European ideal, doesn't suppose a sudden burst of altruism coming from Sarkozy's France, and for that matter, sees no mandate from its own citizens to move from its comfort zone as self-appointed mediator uh, to one of a decider on where Europe must stand. Leadership in Europe now demands a willingness to accept greater, new, and unforeseen responsibilities. It requires greater conviction and a knowing acceptance of risk. It presupposes both a capacity to convince, to take sides, and a record of proven performance in the business of showing the way. Show me where and in whom these attributes coalesce in Europe today. Let me move now to a very unique experience of the very unique experience of France over the last two years following its re rebuff to Europe through its no vote on the Constitution. I'd call that period France's life without Europe. It's important, its importance is in the fact that in almost all respects, nobody cared. Indeed, this absence of people's grief or feeling disadvantaged huh, while on partial leave from Europe 
uh, may be an unarticulated model for other places in the community in the future. The details. Europe was, not just, uh, was just not an issue in the French presidential election. Valérie Giscard d'Estaing, bemoaning the situation, said it was as if France were content to live with its shutters closed. If Europe didn't matter to the candidates as a vote-getting proposition, it was because the candidates were not certain Europe mattered to the voters. After all, having um, rejected endorsement of a European future recommended by the government, the voters could ask themselves, who felt any pain as a result? Rather, the opposite. If the French were told a thousand times they had lost influence in Europe, they just shrugged it off. In reality, the no vote demonstrated that France had already discarded its old conceit. Europe could be tied to French coattails, and Europe's voice challenged, like the Wizard of Oz through the screen, into an echo chamber for reprojection as French into the world. Ironically, in an internal context, the referendum's failure may have been positive. Over the months leading up and through the election campaign, the French stopped blaming Europe for everything and more honestly debated their own shortcomings. Yet, even when Europe was fleetingly the issue these last months, it was not with a sense of renewed French solidarity for European efforts that were not specifically to French advantage. Sarkozy talked about a Europe doing things that protects its citizens, like putting a tax on Chinese imports, presumably in competition uh, with fr uh, French products if the Chinese didn't agree to control carbon emissions, or more flexibilities in the euro's exchange rate against the dollar, which is a return to the old argument that it's, not, that it's the EU's constraints that, that curb French competitiveness, not high unit labor costs. My view is that France took a holiday from the EU, rather enjoyed it, and is now returning to the fold, thinking mostly, what can we get from it this time? This is another way of making a not terribly original observation, that for many of its members, the EU at its heart has become a self-service organization for special national interests. Once Europe's friends could argue that the EU lived with subsidies for everybody because that was the price it had to pay for efforts, for its own efforts at unity and idealism. Now those individual concerns dominate in such a way that no reworked, shortened, or repainted constitution is a good bet to revive the EU's élan. I'll skip over the enormous difficulties of Europe's integration of its Muslim population, its falling birth rate, its mature economy slow growth, and its frequent but very human disinclination not to meet problems head on. In inclination not to meet problems head on. And I'll not go into detail about the conversation I had with Prime Minister Falk Rasmus Rasmussen of Denmark about how, lo uh, how alone he felt uh, not just in Europe, but in relation to the United States, too, when he was deep in grief about those supposedly scandalous cartoons of, uh, of Mohammed. Or uh, elaborate on a talk I had with one of the Pope's collaborators about the lack of su support he felt from Europe's leaders after that speech in which he raised questions about Islam's historical character. This lack of leadership and these individual countries' primary concerns about themselves, I have absolutely legitimate when it comes to the survival of their sovereignty and national identity, move together concerning Europe's capacity or incapacity uh, to respond to the changes in Russia. It's a measure of Europe's predicament to think that this was hardly a concern a few years back when Maastricht was on everyone's lips and the treaty bearing the name of this lovely city seemed part of Europe's inexorable movement toward its own unified and distinct place in the world. What we can say without any trace of exaggeration now, this is not a cold warrior speaking. This is not someone nostalgic <laughs> for 